Let us continue to worship God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, no matter what trials and tribulations we are facing right now, in your presence it is well with our soul. Lead us deeper into your presence. Surround us with your glory and sanctify us by your word. Father, watch over your servant. Forgive my lack of faith. Increase my faith. And use me as a channel of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament is not an easy book to read. Most people make it through the book of Genesis and the first half of Exodus. But if you're like me, you would run into a major hurdle around Exodus chapter 25. And you would be lost in all the detailed instructions on how to build a tabernacle. Since ancient people didn't have the architectural uh, drawings, God spelled out all the details of construction in words. For example, regarding the courtyard of the tabernacle, God says in Exodus 27 verse 9, the south side shall be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains of finely twisted linen with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases, and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. And regarding the entrance on, on the east side, God says, provide a curtain 20 cubits long, a blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer, with four posts and four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze bases. God specifies exactly the dimension, the type of materials, and the color. And the instructions go on and on for several chapters. If you look at the outline of the tabernacle, we see that Seven chapters from chapter 25 to 31 are devoted to the construction plan of the tabernacle, which God gave to Moses. It is interrupted by the golden calf incident from chapter 32 to 34. Then six chapters from 35 to 40 are devoted to the actual construction of the tabernacle, which is essentially a repetition of the construction plan. All in all, 13 chapters, or one third of the book of Exodus, is devoted to the construction of the tabernacle. We know that the Bible is the Word of God and is carefully composed. It does not waste words. It does not have meaningless repetitions. So there must be an important reason for God to devote one-third of Exodus to the tabernacle. The tabernacle has to do with the ultimate purpose of God's redemption. God redeemed the Israelites from slavery so that He may dwell among His people and they may dwell in His presence. That's God's, God's ultimate purpose for creating humans. And we see this purpose being realized in heaven as written in the book of Re Revelation 23, verse 3. And he says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself 
will be with them and be their God. That's in Revelation 21 at the end of the Bible. And tabernacle is God's dwelling place in the Old Testament. The word tabernacle is from the Hebrew word for dwelling. Of course, God can dwell anywhere and everywhere in the universe simultaneously. But God has chosen a certain place to manifest His presence in a tangible way. And that place is the tabernacle. By the way, if you're reading through these chapters, dealing with the construction of the tabernacle, it's helpful to have a visual aid, something like this, from the ESV Study Bible or ESV Bible Atlas. The courtyard of the tabernacle is 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide. Translated, that is about 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. For your reference, the width of this sanctuary, including the north and the south parlors, is about 90 feet. So the tabernacle is modest in size because it is designed to be portable. Whenever the pillar of cloud moves, the Israelites need to pack up their tents and follow the cloud. So the tabernacle is designed to be taken down and be moved. You might ask, what is the relevance of the tabernacle for today? We don't have the Old Testament priests who are physical descendants of Levi. We don't bring animals into the sanctuary and sacrifice them. We don't wear elaborate priestly uniforms to lead in worship. We don't go through a cleansing ceremony to enter the sanctuary. Has not Jesus fulfilled all of these rituals so that we are not bound by them? Yes, the Lord Jesus has fulfilled all of these rituals, so the rules concerning the tabernacle and sacrifices are no longer binding for us. But does that mean that we can skip over them? If we do that, we will miss the riches of God's redemptive plan that has been unfolding since the Old Testament times. And we will remain shallow in our understanding of what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross. You see, God has a purpose for every part of the Old Testament. And here is the key to interpretation. We need to read it, not for the letter of the law, but for the spirit of the law. Instead of, following, instead of following the letter of the law, we need to ask, what is the spirit of the law? What is God's intention in giving the law? What are the spiritual principles? And how do we apply them in our lives today? One of the, the ways of understanding the tabernacle is by making a journey toward the Holy of Holies, the innermost chamber of the tabernacle through worship. So imagine ourselves as worshipers coming from the outside, entering the courtyard, approaching the tabernacle, and gradually moving toward the Holy of Holies. And we will do that over three Sundays. Today we start from the outside and enter through the gate into the courtyard and move toward the altar of burnt offerings. But as we mentioned before, we have a dilemma Remember the metaphor of the sun? If we get too close to the sun, then we will be vaporized instantly. So
So how can we approach the one who is infinitely more powerful than we are? How can we approach the, the one who is infinitely more powerful than the Son? How can we sinners come into the presence of the Holy One? How can our sin mix with God's holiness? You see, we ourselves cannot resolve that dilemma. We cannot approach God on our own terms. But out of His great love for us, God Himself has provided the way. He has provided the way for us to enter His presence. And that is the tabernacle which enables us to approach the Holy God on His terms. As we approach the tabernacle from the outside, we see that there is only one entrance to the courtyard. That is on the east side, which is on the right side of this illustration. The east side is the echo from Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they were expelled toward the east of Eden. On the east side of the garden, God placed cherubim to guard the entrance to keep humans away from the tree of life. The only way to return to God's presence was from the east side. Likewise, the only way to enter the tabernacle is the gate on the east side. Today on the Lord's Day, we have gathered in this sanctuary, some in person and some online. Symbolically, we have entered the tabernacle, God's dwelling place. We do it every Sunday, and it's easy to take it for granted. But have you ever thought that it's only by God's grace that you can come into God's sanctuary? You see, even before you decide to come and worship, God has been calling you. God has been knocking on the door of your heart. Even before you woke up this morning, He has been calling you to come into His presence. The Holy Spirit has, has been stirring up your heart. Even before you realize, God has been calling you to come. That's what makes our worship possible. And that's God's grace. But even if you had a desire to come, you cannot come into God's sanctuary by jumping over the wall. You must enter through the gate that God Himself has provided. The Lord Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 7, Truly, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. The Lord Jesus is the gate that God Himself has provided. It is only by His grace can you enter into God's dwelling place. That's why it is also called God's throne of grace. It is only by grace that we can enter into His presence. Now when you enter through the gate, you will be in Let's go back a few, that's right. When you enter through the gate, you will be in the courtyard, and the first thing that you will encounter is the altar of burnt offering. This is where the, sacrif the sacrificial animals are slaughtered as a substitute for our sin. This is where we receive the forgiveness of sin. In our Christian culture today, there is a tendency to downplay sin as a mistake. We say we all make mistakes. Of course, that is a true statement. 
and mistakes can be corrected by us by improving ourselves. But sin cannot be corrected by us. Sin needs to be forgiven. Sin is fundamentally a sin against God. Even a sin against our neighbor is a sin against God because sin breaks our relationship with God. When we look down on our neighbors because of their race, the color of their skin, or social status, we grieve God. When we look at a human being as a sexual object, we grieve God. When we speak half-truth or use foul language against another person, we grieve God. When we trust and rely on something else other than God, we grieve God. You see, sin breaks our relationship with God and we become alienated from God, and we become alienated from ourself, and alienated from our neighbors. Sin cannot be swept under the rug as if nothing had happened. And being cleansed from sin is a very messy business. As Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Another life has to be substituted for our sin. We cannot be reconciled to God on our own terms, but God himself has provided a way. In the Old Testament times, God provided a temporary way whereby an animal's life was substituted for our life. The book of Leviticus covers the details of the sacrifices, and I will <coughs> mention just a few highlights. When you bring a sacrifice of animals, <coughs> excuse me, it could be one of the many kinds that God specified. Cattle, ox, sheep, goat, dove, or young pigeon. Why are so many different kinds of animals? It is so that everyone, regardless of how rich or how poor they are, can offer something to the Lord. Cattle would be the most expensive, then flock, and the birds would be the least expensive. So those who cannot afford cattle or flock are able to offer birds. You see, God is very concerned about the poor. And He has made sure that the poor can be reconciled to Him and be included as full citizens in God's kingdom. Now, regardless of which animal you choose to offer, it has to be without blemish, without defect. It should never be something that you would throw away. It should never be the leftover stuff that you don't need anymore. God deserves the best offerings that you can bring. God deserves the glory. Isn't that right? Amen. God deserves the glory. In fact, God doesn't need any of your offerings. God says in Psalm 50, every animal in the field belongs to him. The whole world and all that is in it belong to him. He really doesn't need any of your offerings. What he cares about is your heart. Your heart in worship. You see, you cannot fool God by giving him your leftover stuff, your leftover time, half-hearted worship. So you need to ask yourself, each one of us, what is in your heart? What is your motivation 
for coming to worship today? Have you come with a longing for God? Or are you just going through a ritual because that's what you've been doing for the past decades? Does your offering reflect your lack of gratitude or your overflowing gratitude? Have you come to worship to satisfy your emotional needs or to please God? That's a very important principle in worship. Worship is not about pleasing us, but pleasing God. It's not about satisfying our feelings, but giving glory to God. If we seek to please God, then appropriate feelings will follow as we worship Him. But if we seek to satisfy our feelings, then we would fail to encounter the living God. The purpose of worship is to please God by giving Him the best offerings that we can bring. Now, giving God our best offerings involves our preparation. It's not necessarily animals or money or material resources. For example, when you are asked to read the scripture or lead in the prayers of the people or present announcements or lead in music, all of these are your offerings to God. So how do you give your best offerings to God? By preparing your offerings with great love for God. What matters is how much love you put into your preparation. You prepare your heart by praying earnestly throughout the process of preparation so that your heart would be receptive to the Holy Spirit. You prepare your mind by thinking and writing down the words you will be speaking so that you may represent God in a worthy manner. You prepare your whole self by rehearsing many times so that you may communicate clearly to the people in the presence of the King of the universe. Again, God deserves the best offerings we can bring. And you do so by putting love into your preparation. Another lesson that we learn from the Old Testament is that Worship requires our participation. A very common misconception about worship in the Old Testament is that it's the job of the priests and lay people are mere spectators. That is simply incorrect. When you bring a, sacrif a sacrificial animal before the altar of burnt offering, you are not a spectator. You first lay your hand on the head of the animal to be sacrificed. This is a highly symbolic act. Laying your hand on the head of the animal symbolizes that you are identifying yourself with the animal. And your guilt is being transferred to the animal. Then what happens next? I used to think for a long time that it's the priest who slaughters the animal, but that's not the case. It is you who slaughter the animal. It's a gruesome act. You take a knife, cut the animal's throat, and let it bleed to death. Its blood would be splattered all around the altar. It's a concrete reminder of the consequence of sin. When the animal is put to death, it is just as you are put to death with the animal. Then you skin the animal and cut it into pieces. You wash its internal organs and legs with water 
so that everything impure is washed away. That is your part in worship. Worship requires your participation. Of course, there are parts done by the priests, but you are actively involved in worship. That's why I love to see many of you participating and leading in worship. As we've already alluded, the sacrifice of animals was merely a shadow, pointing to the reality that was to come. When the fullness of time had come, God sent His one and only Son to redeem us from the bondage of sin, to set us free from the guilt of sin. He has paid the price for all our sins by offering His own blood once for all. So we no longer need to sacrifice animals at the altar of burnt offerings to receive the forgiveness of sin. But we still need to confess our sins. If you are aware of any sin that you have not confessed, then do not sweep it under the rug as if you can hide it from God. You see, we, including myself, need to confess our sins daily. The Lord's Prayer is a reminder that we need to ask daily for God's forgiveness. And it is appropriate to confess our sins as part of the prayers of the people during our worship. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if you have confessed your sins and have turned away from your sinful ways and have been walking in the newness of life with Christ, then trust the work that Christ has accomplished for you. Do not carry the guilt from the past over and over. Do not dwell in the past, but trust what Christ has accomplished on the cross for you. Trust that the blood of Christ is sufficient for you. Let me share a story which I heard from Pastor Earl Palmer a long time ago, and I paraphrase it. After the World War II, the extent of the Holocaust became known to the world. Six million Jews were killed by the Nazis in the concentration camps. And many Germans were absolutely horrified. And they struggled with the burden of guilt as a nation. In 1962, Karl Barth, a prominent German theologian, came to America to give a lecture series. And people all over America came to hear this famous German theologian. Now, a few weeks before this lecture. Another event happened that was very significant. A Nazi criminal was convicted of a crime against humanity and was executed. His name was Adolf Eichmann. He was the mastermind of the Holocaust. He was in charge of the so-called the final solution the plan to exterminate all the Jews in the concentration camps. But after the war, he somehow escaped and disappeared for many years. But in 1960, Israeli agents located him in Argentina. They captured him and brought him to Israel. 
He was then tried in court, was convicted of a crime against humanity, and was executed. This happened a few weeks before this lecture. During the question and answer time, a person stood up and asked a question. Professor Bart, now that Adolf Eichmann was executed, do you think the sins of Germany can now be put on that man's shoulders? The question was translated from English to German so that Professor Bart could understand it fully. That took some time, and as the crowd was waiting for the answer, you could hear the pin drop. When Professor Bart finally spoke, there was a gasp. He said, no, the sins of Germany are on quite another man's shoulder. And that man is Jesus Christ, not Eichmann. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to the Lord. You see, no one can bear the sins of the world. No one can bear the sins of another person. We cannot even bear our own sin. Our sins are on quite another man's shoulders. And that man is Jesus Christ, fully human and fully God. He is the only one who can bear the burden of our sin. Because Jesus is God, the blood he offered has an infinite value. And there is no sin that his blood cannot wash away. And there is absolutely nothing that we can add to what he has done. His blood is sufficient. His blood is sufficient for you. And all we are called to offer is a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of adoration, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Amen.